Welcome to Hope Bible Church. We're so glad that you are here. Things that we share together. I'm so excited to go through God's Word with you. Uh, this evening, we're in a year-long series in the book of Acts, and we've divided the book of Acts into six acts. And wouldn't you know it, we're already at the end of Act 1, and we've called this act as a sub-series, The Church Begins. And then we end this first series already with a sermon title called this, The Church Blessed. So the sub-series, The Church Begins, ends with a sermon today called The Church Blessed. And I've been so thankful for where we've been again in this series. Um, When you jump into a book like Acts, it's a wonderful process of mind renewal and um, to remember just what the Lord blesses. So in year one of our church in 2004, um, we were in a, a small series in Acts. I think we had six messages we did. It was like the first three months or so within our church's history. And we had, I, I still remember the sermon series title. It was this, and I like, you got to think about it so you say it the right way, but it was in with the old and out with the new. So the whole premise was in year one is like, we don't need what's new. What's new is what the world does and all the new gimmicks of the church and all that kind of stuff. What we need is that which God has always worked in, the things he has always blessed. Um, a fantastic verse for this was Jeremiah 6.16. And it says, stand by the crossroads and look. So you got, you, got, you got two options, right? And it says, look for the ancient paths, the ancient paths, the old paths, and walk in them, the Bible says, and you will find rest For your souls. You see, so it's the understanding there are certain truths and certain things God says, as long as you're in this, these are wells that will never ever run dry. Uh, This past week, um, our pastors and directors were able to get away for about 30 hours on a little mini retreat. And the theme of our time became what is true success? as defined by God? An incredibly important question to understand biblically and to answer biblically. Uh, Who is the person God works in? Who is the church? What is the church that God empowers? Uh, Do we have a biblical understanding of the blessing that will be found in the person that pursues what God says that he will bless for sure? And this is our opportunity right now in Scripture. We're going to be reminded as to what is the blessed church. It will always be this way um, as long as Christ has not returned. So um, as much as we're thankful for the abundant ministry around us, um, we have to be more thankful and more focused on the foundational ministry that is beneath us. So today we're reminded with power, again, asking this question, what are the essentials to the blessed church? As we look at the early church, what were their priorities and what can we learn from them, things that have never changed and will never change? So you haven't already, let's get our Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, we're looking at some very familiar verses Um, It's not new, but it's very, very true, and I'm praying will be very, very fresh for you this uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Acts 2, verse 42. Remember, 3,000 souls were saved. You have this massive revival happening. God's Spirit's at work. It's awesome. And look what happens next. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together uh, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, uh, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And then this, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So good, so rich. Here's how we tackle this passage today. What are the marks of the church blessed? What are the marks of the blessed church? Let's start here. Mark number one for us this evening is this. We see in the early church steadfast devotion. The mark of the blessed church right away we see is a steadfast devotion. Look at verse 42 again. 
Um, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread um, and the prayers. Now, I placed steadfast in our first mark because you see the word devoted in verse 42. Um, devoted means this. Richard Longnecker said this. Many commentators picked it up as well. It means this. Devoted means a steadfast and single-minded fidelity towards a certain course or action. I want to say it again. I want us to get it, okay? When you see the word devoted, it means a steadfast or single-minded devotion um, towards a certain course um, of action. So it's hard to overstate the power of single-minded fidelity within the church. Uh, Eugene Peterson, he coined a phrase, he wrote a book actually entitled this, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. A long obedience, that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful title, it's a wonderful phrase. That in so many ways describes the Christian life. It is a long obedience that requires perseverance and faithfulness in the same direction. Now you imagine a life that is persevering in a long obedience in the same direction. That is hard. It will be a very, very blessed life. You imagine the marriage, the marriage that chooses to forgo the temptation for the next fling or the next feeling or the next pleasure, but a marriage instead that has a long covenantal obedience in the same direction and trusting the Lord and agreeing to stay true to the promises they made before God and one another, and you have a marriage in the end will be so blessed by the Lord as they continue not to see the world around them, but to see the God above them and to pursue that which is faithful in the same obedience for a long period again in the same direction how awesome that is. And then the church, the church that continues to pursue, again, the long obedience in the same direction. An incredibly powerful way, a very difficult way, but a powerful, not the normal way, but a powerful way to live with the power of God and Jesus Christ within us. See, it's when the church, we'll see this in the early church right here, it's when the church loses its love or passion for Christ when you lose your love or passion, you can lose your bearings. And when you lose your bearings, listen, listen, you lose the blessing. You say, why would you say that? It's the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus says it the best. Jesus says, because you've done all these things, but you've lost your first love. If you don't repent and return to me and restore the first love that you had at first, he says, I will take your lampstand, remove it, and give it to someone else. You lose your love, you lose your passion, you lose your bearings. And then you lose the blessing in some form, in some way. You will lose the favor of God and the power of his spirit upon your life, family, or the church. Again, this is why within our church, the four pillars of Hope Bible Church have always been such a blessing right from the beginning. The four pillars, what are they? The four pillars are the foundation of our convictions. I want you to hear this. This is very, very important, okay? This is very, very important counseling. This is very, very important discipleship. The pillars of the church and convictions of our lives become the foundational convictions, okay, that, that, that direct our devotion. Do you have biblical convictions in your life that you can go to at any moment? Like when life is the hardest, when you get confused, when you're totally stressed out, when you're scared out of your mind, when you don't know what to do, you must have biblical convictions that you rely upon that direct your devotion. When they're built on God's promises in his word, they direct your devotion, they're guaranteed God's blessing. They just are. Do you have the foundational convictions in your life? You have to have them to direct your devotion. What do I do now? I don't know what to do. Direct your devotion based on the convictions that guarantee God's blessing. Now, very careful. They does not guarantee an easy life. It does not guarantee uh, freedom from trial. It doesn't guarantee there won't be suffering. In fact, if you have your true convictions laid out here, the devotion understands it's promised suffering. It's promised difficulty. It's promised trial. It's promised persecution, but it's promised blessing. It's promised blessing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have these foundational convictions? If we don't have these as a church, we won't get very far. And that's when we come to Acts chapter 2. That's what's being laid out for us. I've said for so many years, I've said this, i said it's nothing new, it's just Acts 2. I love that that rhymes, by the way. I'm very happy about that. I try to make kids crazy sometimes, how many things I try to rhyme by. 
Anyways, there's no need, you don't need to know anything about that, all right? So I just love the fact that it rhymes, it's nothing new, it's Acts chapter two, because again, it is so true, it is so true. So let's take a look then, in verse 42, what was their devotion towards? Look in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Notice that, teaching. Now, why does teaching come first? Here's why. Because without doctrine, we have no direction, now, don't be scared with, uh, with uh, doctrine. Don't be scared of that word. Some people get all kind of nervous. Doctrine just means teaching. That's all it means. Biblically, it means the teaching, systematic understanding, the approach of understanding what God has taught. Without doctrine, we have no direction. So look up here for a second. Look up here, okay? This book is our compass. The book that God has given us is what every generation of the church must open up, and it points north towards the Lord. The Bible is what uh, steers us away from false teaching. The Bible is what corrects false teaching. The Bible what shows us what glorifies God. The Bible without it, we have no chance. Otherwise, if we close the book, we are walking around a dark forest at night, going around in circles and getting nowhere fast. But you open up the word and it guides us and it shows us this way to God. That's what's happening right now as we open up God's word. The compass is out and we're hearing the Holy Spirit and he's directing us along the path that we are to go. And that is why fundamentally in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, and the Great Commission itself, Jesus says the commands for all time and I command you to teach them everything that I've taught you. Teach them everything, teach them all, everything I've commanded to you right embedded within the Great Commission itself. Paul, in one of the greatest charges of the New Testament, he says to young Timothy, Timothy, I charge you in the presence of the living God who will come to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing, preach the word. How do you stress, more importantly, the priority of the teaching to understand? Without God's teaching, listen, there won't be any maturity. If we keep feeding on milk and pablum, there's just a certain level of growth that we'll never get to. We will remain as children Hebrews 5 says this, everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness and he is a child. If we don't feed on the meat and the nutrients of the word of God, there's certain ways we simply cannot grow. And you know what happens to a child? A child will simply believe everything and anything. I've had four of them. It's true. I mean, they're young enough. You tell them anything and they'll believe you because they don't know any better. And I'm telling you across the church, as long as people remain so infantile with God's word, they'll believe anything too. They'll read any novel. They'll read any fiction story. They'll read any, and somehow they'll think that's because they don't know. They're not trained in the word of righteousness as Hebrews 5 continues and Hebrews 6 says that they can't discern between what's right and wrong or false or truth. That's why we must grow again and move on from milk and move on to the meat of God's word. No offense, vegetarians, okay? It's just biblical right now. It's biblical. This is the metaphor that the Bible uses. We have to understand that. Again, we want to see maturity. We have to understand the priority of teaching. And listen, devotion to the teaching of God's word. And hey, this is, this is so... Has there ever been a time in the history of this nation where a devotion to the teaching of God's word has ever been so needed? And has there ever been so much lostness and so much confusion and so much hopelessness and so much devastation and honestly just so much lies? Has there ever been a time where so much we need book open, humble heart, spirit filled, lead us, Lord, compass in hand, let's go. And we're committed to doing that and we're committed for the Lord just like the early church set out to say the first thing that happens. And why? Because every other aspect, again, of what they're led to do comes from God's word as well. Looked out at verse 42 now. They were devoted to fellowship. Beautiful fellowship. That's the familiar Greek word koinonia. Um, the root of koinonia is common. What we share in common. Now think about that. At its most foundational spiritual basis, brothers and sisters in Christ share that. They share life in Christ. They share the baptism of the Holy Spirit and regeneration. They share the hope of glory. And again, men and women regenerated by the Spirit of God, we share adoption into the family of God. Now just think about that for a second. That is just awesome. You know, they say that blood relatives, man, blood is thick, okay? The blood of Christ is thicker. It's way thicker. 
You may not look exactly like your brother and sister in Christ in this room. Look at all the very different representations, so awesome, so beautiful. But the reality is you think you love your earthly brother and sister and you're related by blood? I'm telling you, man, that blood only lasts a temporal time. The eternal blood of Jesus Christ is going to cause eternity to last between brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ again forever and ever. I mean, how awesome is that, honestly? The depth of relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think this is beautifully pictured in the story. I believe Billy Graham told there was a man walking through Eastern Europe down a city street one day. It was very cold. He was bundled up, but in the joy of the Lord, he was humming a very famous Christian hymn. Another man was walking down the street, and he caught the, the, the hymn that this one man was humming, and he stopped, and they found it immediately. They did not speak the same language, and the other man began to hum the hymn as well. They've never met each other. They may never meet each other again, but what happens is they understand. They both know Christ. They stop. The light goes on. They embrace, they hug, never met, can't speak the same language, but they speak the same heavenly language as brothers and sisters or brothers in Christ. They embrace, they go on their way, and both of them would never forget that encounter again. That's the depth of the fellowship that is shared in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is awesome, isn't it? It is so awesome. Even some of you tonight, as you begin to pray, you pray with someone you've never met before, but you join hands, you are there together, even right now, and you share something so intimate the world will never know apart from Jesus Christ. That is incredible. And that's the fellowship we have in Christ. It's most great basis is spiritual. There's a practical component. We'll get to that as well as the marks continue in this text. We share ourselves. When we share as brothers and sisters spiritually, we share ourselves in love with one another then. That's a natural outflow of the generosity that should be seen from our lives. Notice in verse 42, it continues. They were devoted to the breaking of bread and the prayers The breaking of bread is accurately here um, the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Um, Yes, probably within a common meal, but the essence here is the early church was devoted. Now, this is only a few weeks after Christ's death, and they're so committed already with being so freshly aware and remembering his death, but they refuse to let it go by even for a moment without remembering all that Christ did. How much more you and I? The communion within community or community, again, within the communion that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, that is a beautiful sense of unity and the meals that are shared together as a result. And then we see this, the prayers. The prayers, right from the beginning. Notice, prayerful dependence marked in the early church. Um, before this series is over, I want to make this promise right now. At some point, we're going to allow you to see how prayer is basically in every chapter in the book of Acts. It's it's a wonderful biblical study. You can search up yourself for a preview and be so blessed. It's so awesome to see, though, the church prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. There's, There's barely a chapter that goes by without the church praying in some form to show you just how much, listen, they had a devotion to dependence. I love that. Do we have a devotion to dependence on the Lord? You know, one of the things that I'm recently praying for, and I really ask you to join me in this, um, I'm praying that God would raise up intercessors in our church, specifically over the four services on Sunday. Because I'm just so aware. I have not been discouraged at all. This is the sixth week we've done this four service thing. In fact, I've been encouraged, greatly encouraged as we've gone along. But I just know if anything's going to happen, if lives will continue to be changed, if stories like Julie will be able to be shown and baptism, whatever it is, it's going to be by the Holy Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit works through the devotion of dependence upon God's people. We must have praying, praying, praying church. And I think maybe D.L. Henderson said it. For sure, Pastor George says it. You can't ought people to pray. Right? Like that will only go so far. Hey, Archie, you should pray more. You ought to pray. You're a prayer too, man. So this is the wrong example right here, okay? Because he does pray, all right? But you can say, you ought to pray more. And be like, hey, yeah, I ought to pray more. And you go away and you get it done for about an hour. And then after that, you're left with your shelf again. And then it just doesn't last. Hey, church, you ought to pray more. Yeah, I know, we ought to pray more. But if it's not done by the Spirit of God, if it's not birthed from Him, that's why prayer is so hard. You find prayer, I find prayer so hard, man. My flesh hates it, the enemy's terrified of it right? And it's the battle every day. It's, it's the fight to pray. And yet, Spirit of God, would you raise up men and women, when, men and women and children that are birthed with a desire to intercede on behalf of your church and specifically over the services right now that we might see an awesome working of God in the presence of the Lord and the fear of the Lord? 
Man, God, you do it. Because again, if he doesn't do it, it's not gonna happen. But we pray that he would. How about our prayer meeting this week, Wednesday? Wednesday coming up, 7 p.m., our church-wide prayer meeting. Again, why do we keep doing this year after year after year? This is why. It's the devotion to the dependence because without, without us acknowledging and asking and seeking the Lord, we don't stand a chance. On the screen for you, Charles Spurgeon, he said this, he says, the condition of the church may, very, may be very accurately gauged by its prayer meetings. So is the prayer meeting a graceometer. I like that. And from it, we may judge the amount of divine working among a people. If God be near a church, it must pray. If God be near a marriage, it must pray. If God be near a family, if God be near a relationship, if God be near an elders team, if God be near a staff, if God be near a church community, if God be near, it must pray. And listen, if he be not there, one of the first tokens of his absence will be slothfulness and I bet you we've all been part of different times in different places where we just do not sense that God is near. And one of the hallmark foundational reasons for that is there, there's a lack of dependence and devotion to the Spirit of God through the prayer again to the Lord Jesus Christ. How often that is so true. The early church was so devoted to teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. Let me ask you, based on your life right now, the life that you live, the desires you have, what's your devotion? What's your devotion? How would your devotion be described right now? Ask yourself that. If you're very courageous, you can ask someone who knows you really well. What would my life say that I'm devoted to? And right here, we're being reminded, we can be devoted to so many things that will have no blessing whatsoever. God says to us today through Acts chapter two, you're devoted to these things, you are guaranteed to be blessed. Not easy. You're not guaranteed to be free from suffering. You are guaranteed to be blessed as God decides. Mark 1, steadfast devotion. Mark 2, awe-filled fear. Love this. Mark 2, awe-filled fear. Verse 43. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. The blessed church, loved ones, the blessed church will not be filled with the fear of man. The blessed church will be filled with the fear of God. That phrase there, and awe came upon every soul. That is so beautiful. That is so incredibly healthy. What is awe? Awe is reverence and honor. Um, the wholesome fear of God. One of the great signs that a church is healthy is the church contains the fear of the Lord and the presence of God therein. Oh, when the church is filled with awe, it is a church that will not be complaining, but a church that is grateful. Is the church that won't be apathetic, but we're filled with adoration. It is the church that is not self-centered, but a church that is surrendered. A church not just of programs, but filled with God's presence. A church not of gimmicks, but of God's glory. A church not conforming to the world, but being transformed by the power of God. A church not of a certain personality. A church centered on one person, Jesus Christ. A church filled with awe is a church not with haughtiness, but a church of holiness. And I was, um, this doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, man, I'm so thankful. When I was writing this sermon this week and in my study, and I just unexpectedly, I'm just thinking of these themes and praying as I'm writing, and all of a sudden I just felt overcome with God's kindness and presence and awe to the point where tears welling up my eyes and just at one point tears hitting, hitting the desk and just sitting there and just astounded and amazed and so, and I, and I can't fully explain why, and I don't really care to. It wasn't like something happened. It wasn't some kind of emotional moment of something triggered. It's just, it's just kind of the, the presence of God comes and you just feel the favor of God and the joy of God and you're so humbled by God and you're so in awe of God and you worship God and you're, and you're writing and you just sense how real his book is and how awesome his spirit is and how glorious his glory is. And you're sitting there and you're just encountering the Lord and the grace that he gives to you and you can't, you can't point to anything you've done. You're just trying to seek him and be faithful to him. But I'm telling you, in that moment, there's no amount of entertainment that could come even a fraction close to the satisfaction that you sense in that moment. There's no amount of leisure. There's no vacation. There's no amount of money. There's no human relationship that can produce the, the reality of the glory and the presence and the sufficiency and the satisfaction of the Lord when you're sitting there in, in, in total simplicity and nothing's happening at see me and no one even knows. But between you and God and there you are and you know you're 
we're encountering the living God. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. His grace and how awesome. And to be filled with the awe of God in that way, more God. This is where life is lived. God, forgive me when I pursue so many stupid things. Forgive me for my sinful tendencies and the pursuit of that which is always empty and neglecting you. But you and your grace, you show up again. In your grace, you come near again and you tell me how loved I am and how precious I am when I know what I deserve and I see what I've been given in Jesus Christ. And awe came upon every soul. Man, awe, just, man, is there anything else you want? Filled with the Lord to be used of him. Even as I preach it now, just to believe it so much. Man, pray it with me. Join me in desiring for this to be the normal, the normal expectation of every time we gather. That God's people so hungry and in love with Jesus Christ and filled with the fear of the Lord that we might have awe. But hear this, okay? Awe doesn't happen by accident. You don't stumble into it without an intentional pursuit of God. Getting in shape doesn't happen by accident. There's an intentionality. There's a direction you're going. There's a mindset. You say, why do you bring that up? I think we'll get there in a few weeks, Lord willing. In Acts chapter 5, God sends one of the strongest messages, again, the church would ever have. Ananias and Sapphira. They are lying about their possessions, but the, the, the sin that they commit is they lie to God. They lie to the Holy Spirit. And the consequence is, within the span of a few hours, they both are struck down dead just like that. Okay, now, if you're part of the early church, what do you think all of a sudden you understand how God views sin within the church? I mean, honestly, can you? The text says in Acts, in Acts 5, it says, and great fear came upon the church. Yeah, I bet it did. I mean, I bet it did. Can you imagine the serious level, the seriousness and sober-mindedness? And I just got asked this right now, man. It's just, this is how God views his church too. You know, it's interesting. You think of 1 Corinthians 11, and it talks about the Lord's Supper. And it says, those who receive the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, the text says, this is why some of you have become weak and sick and even died. That's New Testament. Both these examples, they're, they're new, age of grace, New Testament. And people are dying because of their disregard of sinful tendencies before the Lord. It's just, it's just important for us to ask you and say, what sin is represented here right now? What sins right now? are in here that could be so grieving or quenching God's spirit and by God's grace just believe in the power of repentance and not looking for someone around you right now just looking within and what happens is we see that a, refi a refined church becomes a reverence filled church a refined church is a church that reveres and again again so, so awe then awe then Awe is one of the strongest signs of health in the church. Let me say this, okay? Worldliness is anti-awe. I just gotta make sure we're so clear. Worldliness is anti-awe. And so we've filled our lives with the world. No wonder there's no fear of God. No wonder there's no affection. No wonder there's no joy. No wonder there's no pursuit of Christ. No wonder there's no attention span for the things of God. No wonder there's no prayer because worldliness is anti awe If my whole life is about the world, then it can't be of Christ. That's speaking to all of us right now, including me. Mark number two, awe-filled fear. Mark number three, spirit-filled generosity. Look at, look, at, look at verse 44 now. Um, and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, that's, that's awesome. Now, let's be clear, okay? This is not advocating some form of Christian communism, okay? It's not advocating either some form of Christian socialism. Now, what's the number one difference? How can I say that? Here's why, okay? Everything you see here is voluntary. It was all voluntary, it was by the Spirit of God and the joyful desire to be generous. It's also important too, some cults or misled people have taken these verses and tried to enforce them on the church with a strict 
spiritually abusive legalism. Now remember, this is important, and I learned some of this this week myself. 3,000 people were just saved again, right? They were all visitors from all over the world. So, so there, there, there's only one church at this point, and it's the church in Jerusalem. There's nowhere else to go to church at this point. You want to be built up and strengthened? So all of a sudden, you have a major need. You have 3,000 people without a place to stay for very long and needs food. And so that the, the, the community of God begins to rally around and to sell and give. You have a very, very unique circumstance, again, of people being so exceedingly generous. It's just awesome. It's so beautiful. Some of you want to take this and say, well, you've got to sell all your, I've got to sell all your homes. Except you've got to remember, we've got to be careful. And ver- look, at, look at verse 46. Verse 46 says, breaking bread in their homes. Like in this very passage, apparently, people still had homes. Not to mention Acts 12, you had Mary's house, and Acts 16, Lydia's house, and Acts 21, Philip's house. They had homes. They continued to have homes. It's not wrong to own a home. And we also know this too. This example of what's happening here is not given in any other church in the New Testament outside of Jerusalem. However, all that to say, right? You just got to make sure things are in balance. But all that to say though, in verses 44 and 45, you have an extraordinary, voluntary, supernatural generosity between believers. You have an incredible example of of sacrificial, spirit-empowered generosity of everything being held so loosely. I love it. I love it. We want to see that more and more. Without question, one of the telltale signs of generosity in the church where the Spirit of God is working is generosity. It's the generous church. 100% that is true. Whenever God is working by His Spirit, there will be generosity seen within His people. There's an other-centeredness, and there's a joy in it as well. When God's Spirit's working in your life and mine, there's generosity that comes from our lives. Wrote down a few questions here based on Acts chapter 2 to see whether or not we have generosity flowing from our lives, just from our text, things that we can kind of pull out as principles. Ask yourself this right now Is my life other centered or is it self centered? See, how do I find that out? Well, think about how you spend your time, how you spend finances, how you, what the things that you desire. Are these really, are these just, are these other centered or are these self centered? Just, just take a moment right now. Are all my instincts to be about self? Or is there a generosity in my life and longing and loving to be used to encourage others? Do I hold possessions uh, lightly or tightly? Lightly or tightly? The early church was like, here, 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 here. They were so filled with joy in it too. They're like, yeah, yeah, I want to help, I want to help, I want to help. It's just awesome. When the Spirit of God is working, it's just incredible to see how that happens. Really, two, two really good questions here too. Do I grumble at giving or do I find joy in giving? When God's Spirit's working, God loves a cheerful giver. Do I grumble about it? That's a bad sign. Do I find joy in it? Because it's kingdom. It's eternal. It's lasting. It's investing in that which lasts. Do I find great joy? This is a very important question too. Is my generosity to the point that there's a cost in my life due to it? Right. So what do you mean exactly? Sacrificial biblical giving, generous giving, biblically speaking, means you should be able to look at your life and say, I could do ABC, but I've chosen not to because I want to give more to the kingdom. So people who have so much or whatever, and they give, the Bible says, out of their abundance, it doesn't cost them anything ultimately. They might be super wealthy and give a big amount, generally speaking, but in proportion to their wealth, it's nothing. And they do everything. There's, there's nothing they, they can't have. There's nothing they don't get. There's nothing they cannot do. That's not biblical sacrificial giving. Biblical sacrificial generous giving is I could do this, but there's a cost. There's a cost. It's power. The early church had that written all over them. It's so beautiful. Oh, and the last thing here, I want you to see this. Okay, this is important. There is no such thing as a Christian Scrooge. Okay? So this, these two words right here, see this? They're oxymoron. The understanding of Christian and Scrooge, they're incompatible theologically. When, when, when lived out in Christ, that is an oxymoron. It's a theological oxymoron. They, they don't go together. There's no such thing as biblically a Christian Scrooge. A spirit-filled believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who's growing will have a generosity from them. And again, that's exciting to see. So um, you sense the call of generosity from the early church. Can you, imagine, can you imagine if every one of us lived this way? Can you imagine? Now, let me say this. I, just, I see some of you right now as I'm looking and... and, and um, 
man, like there's so many powerfully used people of generosity and beautiful faith in this church. There's so many doing it so well, living so well, so awesome and just so kind and don't have, you, you have no desire to be noticed. It's just, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Imagine every one of us was like that. Honestly, think about this place of grace. Can you imagine the power and the joy and the beauty and just the, 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 the abundance in giving that would be seen again to one another and to a lost and dying world as well. So many doing this so well. I love it. God, do more. Do more in us that we believe. I mean, do you think the early church had joy in this? We know they did. It says they did. We'll see that in just a second too. So, what are the marks of the blessed church? Steadfast devotion, right? Steadfast devotion, awe-filled fear, spirit-filled generosity, and finally this, beautiful unity. The mark of a blessed church is beautiful unity. Look at verse 46 now. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. I want to I want to break this verse down on the screen for you. I want to put up um, here's how the unity looked. Number 1, I want you to see this. First of all, notice a daily unity. Beautiful unity church is a daily unity. Twice in two verses it says day by day. So this isn't a once a week Christianity. If you think that you can fully grow in Christ by and this is all you get, this is all you get, 5 p.m. service once a week, it will not work out well. There must be further deposits of community and unity within our lives and in some form on a day-by-day basis of being in relationship with one another. That type of Christianity, again, you'll only go so far. Notice in the text, in the temple and in their homes, group time fellowship, man, group time fellowship, accountability, loving, caring for people, being known, knowing others, all of that. We can't do this by ourselves. A daily unity. Notice also a simple unity. The text says they were together. Twice it says that. They were together. It's pretty hard to have community without being together. Notice the promotion of unity within community and community within unity. The Holy Spirit immediately in the birth of the church taught them this. On the screen for you, there's a quote here. Right here, ready? This is the principal truth. You cannot fulfill God's will for your life without being connected to his church. You've got to hear that, okay? You've got to hear that. Who's that for right now? So many people, man, they say, well, no, I'm going to be, I don't need to do whatever. Listen, listen. Biblically speaking right now, you cannot fulfill, you cannot be fully in God's will for your life without being connected to his church in some form, in some way. I heard this great illustration or story this week. There was a, a young man who came up to a wiser man in the faith, and the young man, he was complaining. He says, I don't be part of the church. I don't need the church. I'm going to do it by myself. And the wise um, older man in the faith a long time, he did, he did not say a word. He was tending a fire. And in the fire, he took out a coal that was very hot and glowing where it was with the other kind of embers and coals there. He took out the coal, isolated it with the tongs, put it on the ground uh, beside it by itself. They watched this coal separated from the rest of the fire there, put on the ground, and after a few moments, the coal started to lose its flame, lose its ember, lose its heat, and become isolated and to become very cold and without any life. The older man then took it with the, with the tongs, took the, took the coal, put it back in the fire, and all of a sudden, that coal was relit and engaged in the flame. The, young, the older man did not say a word to the young man, but he said everything the young man needed to hear, and the young man went away with a lesson fully engaged and fully understood. We cannot do this life on our own. The flame and the heat and the passion, it comes together as we're engaged in the body of Christ. Now, some of you, and I've heard people say this over so many years, man, the church is messed up. Yes, it is to the glory of God, okay? Well, the church is full of sinners. And you are, you know what I mean? I'm just like, and you're not a sinner? Yes, we're all sinners. It's called this side of heaven, man. Where's the grace? Well, I've been let down by the church. So have I, you know? And just like, well, well, I had problems with the church. You know what my biggest problem is in the church? Me. I'm the biggest problem I know, man. It's the heart inside and all the sinfulness that's here. I am the biggest problem. And anyone with some understanding will say, you're the biggest problem too. It's called the theology and the reality of sin within us, man. Well, the church, you know, it's a full bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, that happens. 
But again, you throw the whole baby with the bathwater, you will be missing out. And God has designed his church for the people of God to be strengthened and matured and growing and loved and taught and corrected and rebuked and cared for and ministered to all the way until Jesus Christ returns. And furthermore, you don't like the church? Well, then Jesus died for the church and married the church and he's the head of the church. Last time I checked, Jesus loves his church, okay? And you're going to tell me that you don't? That makes you out of step with Jesus himself and the reality of what the church represents. I think the church is messed up. Yeah, yeah, as I said, it is. But by the grace of God, we continue on. Amen, church? Amen. And how encouraging it is to see that again, the daily unity and the simple unity. And we see this now, the joyful unity. Look at, look at, look at verse 46. It says, they receive their fruit with glad and generous hearts. You know this wasn't forced at all. It was the fruit of God's spirit flowing through them. What I love here is see the word um, generous. The word generous in other translations beyond the ESV, it says uh, simplicity or sincerity. I love that. There was a joyfulness of the simplicity and sincerity found within their generosity. Um, I I love simplicity. I'm not there yet. I want to grow more in it trying to be prayerful about what that looks like in my life. I just, I just love, you know that, um, that phrase in the little adage that says, the more you own, the more it owns you? That's very important in our day. I've watched so many people spend their whole lives trying to keep up with what they own because in the end, they are slaves to the things that they possess. I hate that. I just, I can't stand that feeling. I just personally want nothing to do with it because you get so distracted with life, you miss life in its totality in Jesus Christ. That's why I love simplicity, trying to find ways. Lord, what is simplicity? Look, the people here in the early church, they had incredible, beautiful, joyful generosity and simplicity and sincerity, and that's why they were just like, yeah, yeah, here, take, take, it's here, it's yours, whatever. And they received together and gave together with glad the joy, the joy that they had. You know, the more you own, the more it owns you. It steals your joy too, doesn't it? It just does. We all know that feeling. And this is how our world operates our world operates entirely within the system of gotta have more, gotta have more, gotta have more, gotta have more. That's why so many people are just so miserable. The ability to hold so loosely and to see the unity that is found in generosity and joy. And then lastly, this, a favored unity. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They had a favor of God in worship. They had a favor in God with others. They had a favor in God with growth with growth that that is there too. Truly this church was so blessed. Not a perfect church, but it was a blessed church. Again, look at verse 47. It says, praising God. That's worship and that's also singing. That's singing. So on this Thanksgiving weekend, I think a great way to end our service here on the themes of unity and joy and togetherness. We're gonna sing, obviously, but we're gonna sing a song that has the themes of unity and has the themes of joy, and we're gonna sing a song that's a bit celebratory and a little bit rowdy to end the service, all right? And so I'm hoping you will engage in these themes and delight as with the example of the early church before us and choose to celebrate what we share in Jesus Christ um, as well. Let's pray, church. Let's be so thankful um, as we do. So Lord, I do pray. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for these incredible truths. Thank you for a church of devotion. Thank you for a church that desires to be filled with awe, Thank you for your church of generosity, and we pray for such a powerful sense of unity, even now, even now as we sing, Lord, work, strengthen, and encourage. We pray this together in Jesus' name, amen.